Heavenly Father, thank you for this day you set aside for us to worship you. We call it the Lord's Day, and it's a day of celebration. Today is truly a day of celebration because we have come together to worship you here in this place. It's only a few of us right now, but how, how meaningful it is that we get to celebrate you on the day that a lot of people consider as the first day, as the birthday of the church, where the Holy Spirit came, your spirit came and filled your church. So do that now with us, we pray, as we worship you. How we have longed for this, this day. In Jesus' name, amen. Good morning. I know it's just a handful of us in here, but because of the guidelines, perhaps, it's being spread out like this, it's, this place feels, still feels pretty full. <laughs> Let's celebrate the Lord's grace that brings us to this place today. Amazing grace. Amen. 
Amen. God is good. Amen. Ah, His amazing grace, obvious in this place. Hey, let's stand. Jesus' blood and righteousness. I dare not trust the sweetest prayer, but only trust in Jesus' name. Christ alone, cornerstone, weak made strong in the same. seems to hide his fame. I rest on his unchanging grace. In every high and stormy gale, my anchor holds within Father, what a thought, what a thought, not to just be before you, but to stand before you, not in my own righteousness, but in the perfect, absolute, powerful righteousness of Jesus. We come to you today, Lord God, confessing that we have nothing to add to our salvation but living out our birthright as a child of God, together making this confession as we worship you. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. Let's recite together the Apostles' Creed. I believe in God, the Father Almighty, creator of heaven and earth, and in Jesus Christ, his only Son, our Lord, who is conceived of the Holy Spirit, 
born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, dead, and buried. He descended to the dead. The third day he rose again from the dead. He ascended into heaven and sits at the right hand of God, the Father Almighty. From there he shall come again to judge the living and the dead. I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Holy Universal Church, the fellowship of the saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Amen. Amen. Praise God. Let's go ahead and greet our family members. Say hi to the people in front and behind you. All right, for those of you who are watching this video, we do have a very small group here worshiping together. You may be seated after, you, after you've greeted one another. <laughs> and this is kind of a test run for next week, because next week we are going to have our official uh, restart in this place of our worship service, the worship service that we get to offer to the Lord together. And so that's exciting. And we're looking forward to that. And as a test run, uh, our guinea pigs here, your pastor's families are the guinea pigs, and we are here in this room. And just to see how it feels and how we will be uh, abiding by the guidelines and everything like this. Next week is a very significant week for our, for our church as well because it is our ninth year anniversary. Our ninth year anniversary of the beginning of the church, uh, the local church, the house. Uh, we started nine years ago uh, in Woodland Hills. We moved over to Reseda a few months later, and now we're back here in Northridge. And so it's been very exciting. God has been so faithful. We get to celebrate his faithfulness. We don't have gifts for you. We, don't have, we can't be feasting together like we love to do. We'll, we'll, let's, we'll, let's just reserve that for the 10th birthday, 10th year anniversary. But this year is still very meaningful in that we actually get to come together on that day. So let me give you some guidelines for what is happening next week. Guidelines for next week's worship. First one, hand sanitizing is a must. When you come in from the, uh, from the outside, we will, we will have hand sanitizer available for you. So everybody must do that. Temperatures will be checked. Temperatures will be checked. We already have thermometers here, so they are ready to go. And I believe the magic number is 98.7. 98.7. If we are going to check you, show you the number, and if you are above 98.7, feel free to go ahead and go home. Blessings to you. We love you very much. Before I proceed, let me, let me address this. You may feel a little bit um, hesitant about coming and worshiping yet. You're just not ready for various reasons. Most importantly, you've been sick. Stay home. Uh, you can stay home, please. Do everybody a favor, stay home. Or you're just uncomfortable uh, coming together with uh, your church at this point. I understand that. Fully, fully, fully understandable. And if you're not, your heart is not comfortable, no condemnation from our part or God's part at all. But you say, wait a minute, I'm a worshiper of God. I still have to feel the obligation to worship God. You've been worshiping at home. The Lord understands the circumstances. Nothing happens outside of his providence. And when you worship at home, and this video obviously is being recorded next week, and this is kind of a test run, next week's also will be recorded. So in that evening, Lord willing, that evening we will post it so that you can worship together around the same worship service, and we will be gathering that way as well. That also is a legitimate gathering, and it's a gathering together to worship. Under the circumstances, I think God has been absolutely gracious in receiving that worship, and it's been such a blessing for all of us who've been participating. So don't feel guilty or feel bad for any reason if you feel that you should still worship at home. Please do it. You have older people at home, and you feel like you might bring something back in. Any level of discomfort is a good enough reason to stay home and worship. Is that enough? Good. I hope so. But still, having said that, it is our first time back, so if you are inclined to come, welcome, welcome. As you can see, we're putting in all the guidelines to make it as safe as possible. When you come in, you will pick up the Lord's Supper elements and the program as you enter. They will be pre-prepared for you. 
That means it'll be laid out already before. There's another service that goes on before it's been laid out. You'll have no worries about being contaminated by those things that you touch. And we get to have the Lord's Supper together. They're, they're prepackaged. We're not passing out anything. They're prepackaged so for, for the sake of safety, abiding by the guidelines. We will all sit six feet apart from one another. The exception is, of course, with your families. And if your families stay together, that will really facilitate getting enough people in here sitting six feet apart. And that's completely doable. Now, if this room does not accommodate the six feet apart, eventually, if more, more people come in, we can also have people worshiping in the fellowship area. You know our fellowship area that can accommodate a lot of people. Masks are a must. Right now, a lot of us here, all of us, Right now, whatever the case is, next week in the congregation, in the congregation, we will all be wearing masks out of consideration for one another. No lunch or fellowship at this time. Ah, no lunch or fellowship at this time. Um, it's like, I'm okay without the f fellowship, but I need the food. Oh, just kidding. Uh, yeah, uh, we, we miss that time. We miss the happy birthdays, but we'll reserve that as the Lord opens more doors. And we will all go directly home afterward. Oh, I'll go directly home afterward. No hanging out in the, in the fellowship room or in the parking lot uh, for now. All right? Okay. So these are the guidelines. Okay. Okay. After this, we have the special song by Jenny and David.
their Heavenly Father. Truly that you are a loving God. At this time, Lord God, we thank you for giving us a privilege and opportunity to worship you, not only on, online, but we are here in your chapel or this building to worship you together with, with, our, with our brethren who are willing, who are eager to worship you and to give praise and honor to you. Lord, we thank you for this privilege. In spite of this uh, pandemic that we have, the Lord God, we thank you. In spite of this, Lord, you give us freedom to worship everywhere, even Lord, in the play, in our in our, our home, in a different places, as we open as they open their cell phone, their laptop, their computer. This is a privilege, of Lord God, to worship you in different places, in a different situation. As you tell to the Samaritan woman that they can worship not only in Jerusalem, but everywhere, to worship you in spirit, and in truth, we are here, Lord God. We want to please your name, to worship you. Let your Holy Spirit to move in our midst so that your name be glorified. And let your word be manifest, Lord God, in our lives. And let your word spread to all the nation and to every people who can hear the, your words. Bless our pastor, Pastor Paul, as you use him as a channel of your blessing, let your word truly manifest to every one of us, Lord God. And let the power of your word remain in our hearts, Lord God. And this I pray, Lord, and we thank you, and we give back to you all the glory and honor, because it's belong to you, because you are our God, our Lord, our Savior. In the mighty name of our Lord Jesus Christ, this I pray. Amen. Amen. All right. Praise God. Thank you, Pastor Karen and uh, Jenny and David. Thank you for pre-recording this special song for us. Okay. God's Word. 1 Samuel, chapter 24. 1 Samuel, Chapter 24. 1 Samuel chapter 24. Reading from verses 1 through 3. 1 through 3. When Saul returned from following the Philistines, he was told, Behold, David is in the wilderness of En Gedi. Then Saul took 3,000 chosen men out of all Israel and went to seek David and his men in front of the wild goat's rocks. And he came to the sheepfolds, by the way, where there was a cave, and Saul went in to relieve himself. Now David and his men were sitting in the innermost parts of the cave. Let's pray one more time. Heavenly Father, open your word to us. Help us to utilize our times of isolation to your glory and our good. In Jesus' name, amen. The do's and don'ts of cave dwelling. The do's and don'ts of cave dwelling. Um, it seems to me that in a very, 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 very real way that we have been somewhat holed up in our own private caves for these about three months or so, right? So I think it can be very, very well, de well described as cave dwelling in a way. And because of this time of isolation and quarantine, people got a little bit bored. And so they, they started messing with traditional concepts and traditional pictures, you know? And one of them is the Mona Lisa, right? You've seen, right? Maybe some of you have seen these kinds of things. So, so what they do? <laughs> and Mona Lisa is just sitting there. You can do whatever you want with her. You can put a mask on her, right? 
And they envision Mona Lisa at the end of the quarantine like this, where all the roots are growing out now, and she has not been able to go to the hairdresser. Uh, okay, I guess at least she's able to put on curls, right, and put on some makeup, which is good. Okay. Well, now, now we are able to go to the barber. I'm really looking forward to getting my hair cut next week, and I'm sure many of you are as well. And uh, here's, here's, here's actually a, a, another series that I, I, I enjoyed, I think, uh, the most. And this is Mona Lisa in March. This is Mona Lisa in April. <laughs> and this is Mona Lisa in May. <laughs> okay. Yeah. Ah, get me out. Get me out. Well, I, I, I think you can all relate, Yes. Maybe there have been moments when you've been just in the same space with the same people with just too, for just too long. <laughs> and uh, we all can relate to that. I think David, King David, to be King David before he was king, can certainly relate to that. We're talking about about three months, and it does something like this to us. David had been on the run from King Saul, who wanted to kill him and his men for about 10 years. 10 years he'd been running for his life. And during that time, very often, he would stay in caves. Uh, There are famous caves, caves of Adullam and caves or strongholds of En Gedi. And these caves are are big systems of caves. They're not just like a little hole in the wall. If we go to the cave of Adullam, I was watching a documentary in preparation. You can go inside, and there are all kinds of tunnels, and these tunnels open up into these huge caverns where you can certainly fit hundreds of people inside. And these caves of Engedi apparently, were something like this. Saul hears that David is hiding out in this area, and goes to seek him out and to kill him with 3,000 choice soldiers. And Saul goes into a cave. Now, why does he go into a cave? First of all, what is his, what is, what concern does he have? Or a cave? Well, in the Hebrew, it says something to, has to do with his feet. In the Korean, it says, so I think that, yeah, so, so the Hebrew, the, 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 it, it, it's like that. In Korean, kind of you know, euphemistically says, to uncover his backside. Yes, he went in to relieve himself. He's looking for a bathroom, and so he thinks that a, a cave is a good place for this. It just happened. What are the chances? It just happened to be the same cave that David was hiding in. David and his men are hiding there. Saul is going about his business. One of his men say, God is giving your enemy into your hand now. Let's rise up and kill him right now, and we'll be done. You'll have vengeance on your enemy. He's trying to kill you. You're fully justified. God's sovereignty is obvious. Go get him now. So the story unfolds. David himself gets up. He creeps up behind Saul. He whips out his sword and cuts off, not his head, (laughs) but his shirt, okay? A piece of his shirt. He just slices that off and goes back into the recesses of the cave. Saul doesn't have, has no idea what happened, has no idea how close he came to death, and after he's done with his business, he goes out. After he goes outside, David follows, follows him and says, my king, my king. Saul turns around and sees David, and David says, look, I have a piece of your shirt in my hand, and some people encouraged me to kill you today but I would not lift my hand against one that God has anointed to be king. What a beautiful story, right? What a majestic story. Here, from David's experience in these caves, we get some principles that we can apply to our lives. Um, And let me, I, I can't believe I had Mona Lisa up there staring at us like that the whole time. So do's and don'ts of dwelling in a cave. Here we go, I got three. Do trust, don't panic, and do write a song. Do trust, don't panic, and do write a song. First, do trust. Trust in the Lord with all your heart. Lean not on your own understanding. In all your ways, acknowledge him, and he will direct your paths. 
Proverbs chapter 3, verses 5 through 6, a passage you should have committed to your mind and to your heart and applied to your lives. Obviously, David applied this principle to his life. We see this here in chapter 20, 24, verse 15. Chapter 24, verse 15. May the Lord therefore be judged. This is David crying out to King Saul. May the Lord therefore be judged and give sentence between me and you and see to it and plead my cause and deliver me from your hand. David says, I am not going to take my, take my life into my own hands. I am not going to follow the advice of the people around me or the way that I see things unfolding. No, I will trust in God to take vengeance for me. I will trust in God to unfold his plans in my life. I will, re I will re rely on him for my salvation. He cries this out to, to his King Saul. Now, think about this situation. I mean, David could have easily justified himself. God had told him that he would become king. In order for him to become king, the present king has to be out of the way, right? Falls into God's promises and plans, right? And this enemy king happens to come in. What are the chances of that? Exactly where he is, he is walking in. The enemy is being handed to David on a plate. And even his trusted advisor is telling him, God is giving your enemy into your hand right now. So people are telling him, kill Saul. The circumstances are telling him, kill Saul. There are some, you know, some, some people in our, in our faith. I believe they are still, our, for the most part, our brothers and sisters. But this teaching is so, so wrong and perhaps even satanic. Well, they teach that if you want something to be, you have to believe it is, act on it, confess it, and it'll happen, right? Word, faith, movement, name it and claim it to put it a little bit more fun. So somebody believes in this, sees this car on the street. That is my dream car. I want that car. Comes up, to, and he's praying as he walks up to it. He's praying, Lord. I want that car in your name. It's mine. He walks up to it, tries the handle. The door opens. He looks inside. The key is in the ignition. Oh, God has answered my prayer. He gets in and drives off. What happens? He's driving to jail, y'all, right? He's going to jail, and rightly so. You can't blame God for that, for the, for the providence, right? No way. What he needed to do, what that man needed to do, what David does here, he applies the principles of God. He applies the heart of God. This man, after God's own heart, applies the wisdom of God to the circumstance and says that God set up this man to be the king of Israel. It's not my hand that's going to kill him. God will do what he needs to do in his time. I will trust in him. So... That's what we see also in Jesus' life. Jesus is trusting completely in the will of God. When he was cornered, when his life was on the line, we see Jesus trusting for dear life completely in God. But different from David's case, David, Jesus actually gave up his life. But when he was in the hand of, of Pilate, remember? Kind of like a king figure. And Pilate says, don't you know, I've got your life in my hand. You know what Jesus said? You would have no power unless my dad gave it to you. Unless God had given it to you, you would have no power. Pilate thinks he's in control, but Jesus knows who truly is in control. And so Jesus looks like he's the one in control, and he is. He is in absolute peace, in absolutely dire circumstances, because he is trusting, he is leaning and trusting in the Heavenly Father. I want to encourage you, during this pandemic, during this time of cave dwelling, we, it, looks like the, it looks like the restrictions are going to be lifted. But before that happens, utilize whatever time we have left to lean in and to trust. Trust in him rather than other things or other people. Don't listen so much to the advice around you if that advice is leading you astray. Whether it's coming from your heart or from the outside, listen to the advice of God in his word. Trust in him. Trust in the Lord that he knows what he is doing. When things get bad, remember that he said it would be that way. 
and trust Him. You know, one of the biggest things, and I find this in my own heart as well, I thought I was okay. And this is my arrogance and, and um, how do you say? I think we are, the, we are the worst evaluators of ourselves, no? I find that money has a huge hold on my heart. I found that. But what, and, and what, what is that? It's the fact that I have put trust in how much or how little money I have, right? I, I can feel it have a grip on my emotions. And what's ironic is that in American money, what does it say? <laughs> in God we trust. And I think that's very providentially a good reminder. Whenever you feel leaning toward, whenever you feel uneasy because you don't have enough money, when you feel satisfied because you have some money, remember, God has providentially placed his message on that money for you. In God we trust. Not in George Washington. That's only a $1 bill, right? (laughs) Not in Thomas Jefferson or not in anybody else. God, we trust. Can I get an amen? Remember, let's do that. While we're dwelling in the cave, while we can actually think clearly, let's think in faith. Let's trust. Second, don't panic. (laughs) Don't panic. What we see in David's life here is that this man panicked. The worst place to make decisions that will impact your life is when you are panicky, when you are under pressure, When you feel the walls of the cave caving in on you, literally caving in on you. When you feel, when you didn't know, but you you didn't know you had this before, but now you know you suffer from claustrophobia. And I think there's going to be a lot of people who never knew they had claustrophobia realize they have it during during this pandemic, right? But look at what the Bible says. Behold, I am the one who has laid the foundation in Zion, a stone, a tested stone, a precious cornerstone, a sure foundation. What is that? Better, who is that? Everybody, right answer to most Lord's Day school questions is? Jesus, that's right. With that resounding answer, Jesus, okay, is the right answer. Jesus is our cornerstone. Jesus is our foundation. Whoever believes will not be in haste. You won't be easily shaken. You won't be easily shaken. David was shaken. David had been chased by Saul for such a long time. So in verse 27, uh, chapter 27, after another miraculous deliverance like this, a close call, look at what David says. I almost, I, I, I almost read it in Korean just now. <laughs> David said in his heart, now I will die one day by the hand of Saul. There is nothing better for me than that I should escape to the land of the Philistines. Then Saul will despair of seeking me any longer within the borders of Israel, and I shall escape out of his hand. So David, under all kinds of pressure, comes up with the brilliant plan to run away into the land of Goliath. What? Right? What in the world? He's going to run to the, to the enemies, right? And when he does this, he basically makes himself an enemy of Israel. A king of Israel? Forget being king. He becomes an enemy of Israel. As a matter of fact, because of this tragic decision, at one point, he almost ended up fighting against Israel, killing Israelites And that would have completely decimated all of the promises and plans that God had placed in David's life. If there was ever a low point in David's life, this was it. Terrible place to make life-altering decisions. And if you are feeling the pressure, oh man, hearing about all the riots and things that are going on right now, last night when when we heard the news, a certain kind of a darkness came over our hearts. When you're feeling the pressure, when your heart is getting panicky, life-altering decisions are not well made during a panic attack, right? One thing that we see about Jesus is that Jesus is cool. (laughs) Jesus is cool in 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 the Webster dictionary sense of coolness. He's calm under pressure. 
I love it. We just saw a beautiful scene like that when Jesus' life is on the line, when he's being beaten to a pulp. He knows who's in control. Another scene that I see is Jesus is asked by a panicky father, please come and heal my daughter. She's about to die. Jesus says, I'll come and heal her. And as he is going, a woman that had been sick for a very, very long time touches the, the hem of his garment. Kind of reminds you of Saul's uh, hem of Saul's garment. But this is Jesus' garment. And so when this woman touches it, she's healed on the spot. You know what Jesus does? He stops everything. <laughs> panicky, panicky father. Uh, pa- uh, uh, disciples concerned about his popularity. <laughs> stops everything. Because this father was a very influential man. He stops everything. says, who touched me? And then Jesus heals her inside and out. Jesus heals her not only in body, but he restores her in in, in that society. He proclaims her absolute healing. And now this woman who had been isolated, like us in a way, from from the normalcy of life, where everybody else was going to church, she could not. When people were getting married, there was no way. And when she had been completely ostracized, but now... She's being fully restored to society, and spiritually, she meets her Lord. Isn't that good? Isn't that beautiful? Jesus is cool in this way. I encourage you, don't make life-altering decisions when you're feeling the pressure. And just kind of, this is kind of serious, so just another scene is is on my mind is, and it's this, a pastor I'm not sure if you've heard this. I shared this with you. But a pastor, if you're a smoker and you know your pastor doesn't like smoking, preaches against it and things, and your pastor starts walking up to you, you can get a little panicky, right? So a pastor describes a guy who's, who's a smoker in his church. He meets him on the street. He's walking up. The guy puts the cigarette behind his back. As if that's going to hide the burning cigarette as his head becomes like a chimney, you know, smoke coming out the back. On another instance, he took his cigarette. A guy took his cigarette, he says, and put it in his pocket. And so the pastor just kind of just waited (laughs) to see what would do, what he would do, and what would happen. Uh, Being panicky is not a good place to make life-altering decisions. But it is a good place to write a song. Write a song. In Psalm 57... The, 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 in Psalm 144, I will sing a new song to you. What is that? Is just God, God, does God just get bored in hearing the same old songs again and again so he wants a new song? No. It has to do with that redemptive historical events. All right, that, that put it hard. It has to do with what God does, the salvation he brings about in your life. God is always doing something new. You learn a new aspect of God. You can if your spiritual eyes are open every day, especially within the confines of, of a cave, when you can actually not be disrupted by, all, by your school, by your friends, by the pressures, where you can think clearly and you can experience God in a powerful way. That's a good place to write a song. And that's what David did. In Psalm 57, the song that we meditated on last week, it begins, and it's a part of the Hebrew Bible. It's a part of the text. That's why the Hebrew Bible, the verses start with verse 2. The first verse is the title. And the title says this, a song of David when he fled from Saul in a cave. This was written during one of David's cave dwelling moments. He wrote this song, do you remember? Last week we meditated on this and we saw these kinds of aspects of this song. The Savior, right? I gave you an acrostic. One, it's his wings. It talks about sheltering under God's wings and his wings provide shelter. His wings are always accessible and available. His wings are victorious and his wings are inviting. His wings are omnipotent. His wings are refreshing. Remember? Remember that? And the way to live under those wings is, is to have, to be honest and open before him because there's nothing to hide, nothing that can be hidden. 
and hope in his deliverance because he is still there. And we holler at the enemy or scream into the storm, however best you can you want, like to remember it. And then it results in singing hallelujah, singing praises to God. All of this came from the time that David spent in the cave. How are you spending your time in the cave? I know some of you are more busy than ever. I asked Pastor Manny, I see Pastor Karen, they're still going to work. <laughs> Nothing has changed for them. If anything, it's going to become more busy. Right? Actually, you're, Pastor Manny, you're working from home, but you're busier than ever. You have more hours and things like this, right? Yeah, yeah. But for a lot of us, a lot of you, you have more time. These days for me, because I'll just be, um, I'll just speak for myself, I, I, some people say, well, they say, well, Pastor Paul, it must be good for you because I know your church does the crazy Korean thing of 5.30 morning or in the morning worship services. And you don't have to do that anymore. You can finally sleep in. You know what? There was a day when I thought, yeah, I could sleep in. Guess what happened? No alarm, no nothing. I'm up at five, okay? <laughs> I can't, dude, going to sleep at midnight doesn't change anything. I'm still up at five. And so these days what I've been doing and what has been very precious is that I got to spend those hours at beginning at five, going immediately to a place where I can pray and spend some time with the Lord. They have not been perfect. I can improve those times so much, but they have been so good. They have been so good. And I encourage you, write songs. <laughs> Metaphorically speaking, I know not all of you are gifted that way. Write in your journal. Write on your heart. Write these memories of this time. We may never be given another opportunity like this. Use the cave dwelling moments to dwell with the Lord, to dwell in the Lord and ask him to transform your life and write down the experience of God that you have. Experiences of deliverance, experiences of growth, experience of expansion. Maybe you cannot go outside of these doors, but your heart can be expanded and then You'll be, you'll be given tools to, to proclaim his goodness once you're out of the cave. All right. You say, Pastor Paul, that's all good. The other two points, you focused on Jesus. You skipped this one. I see you. I see you. Because Jesus never wrote anything. You're kind of right. You're kind of right. I know that he could write. Remember, he wrote on the ground with the woman caught in adultery. He was writing on the ground, but the Bible never tells us what he wrote. True, I give you that. But we have the Bible, don't we? He wrote the Bible. He wrote it through his Holy Spirit. So he does write, doesn't he? But further than this, I want to say this, that he is still writing. He is still writing. There's a church planting network called Acts 29. Acts 29. The book of Acts only has 28 chapters. What does that mean? What do they mean by saying Acts 29? That God is still unfolding his salvation plan. That God is still in the process of writing his love for humankind in, the, in human history. He's still writing and on human hearts. Jesus doesn't write with pen and paper. He writes by the power of the Holy Spirit on human hearts and lives, on your life and mine. So somebody says this, said this, each day you write the gospel by the things that you say and the things that you do. What then, my brother, is the gospel? The gospel according to you. Another pastor put it this way, you will not be saved by your works, but others will. Others will. What does that mean? Non-believers do not read the Bible. Why should they? They read People who read their Bibles, you and me. So Jesus writes his love, writes it large in our hearts and in our lives. And he gives us the privilege to sing those songs in front of the whole world and for the encouragement of our brothers and sisters and to be a challenge and an invitation to those who don't know Jesus. You are Jesus' love song. You are Jesus' love song to his Father, carried on the wings of the heavenly dove, the Holy Spirit. 
And I pray that you will continually, continually become more and more a beautiful love song and beautifully and often sung by you and by all those around you. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, here we meet together in this very cave-like place outside the pandemic, the riots. Hide us under, under the shelter of your wings until these storms pass by. And while under the shelter of your wings, meet us here and write your song in our hearts. And Holy Spirit, give us the courage, the joy, the initiative to sing. In Jesus' name, for his glory, amen. Let's sing. Please stand. Remember this image? This is where you and I are as we proclaim how precious Jesus is together. And silver or gold, I'd rather be his than have riches untold. I'd rather have Jesus than houses or lands. I'd rather be led by his name. confess that we would rather have Jesus 
than money, than fame, than health, than any kind of peace that the world provides. You are our peace, pleasure, and treasure. And we give you all the praise. As an expression of this, many of my brothers and sisters have given to you through giving through this ministry. I pray that you would be so kind as to receive it. And receive it not in the amount or in the percentage that we give, but receive it as a symbol of all our lives, because every bit of it belongs to you. And we're so happy. We're so happy, most privileged to know this is true. We love you. In Jesus' name, amen. Savior, Jesus Christ, the unending, unfathomable love of God, the Father Almighty, the conviction, the presence, the protection, and the power, the oneness of the Holy Spirit be upon every child of God, sheltering underneath His wings, be upon them both now and forevermore, for Jesus' sake and glory, amen. Praise God. Have a blessed Lord's Day. Have a wonderful Lord's Day.